We are all wandering in this aimless world. We all have stories that only the Dong like us knows. In this world, people have become like the sea. Dong, just like thousands of people in this city who have never met, is a mayfly in the sea of this city. In the sea of people of the city, it looks like a group, but most of them are solitary. Three years after graduation, Dong stayed in the provincial capital city six hours away from his hometown. He smiled on the day he reported to his company, happy that he had finally broken free. Dong works for a curatorial company. The biggest case he participated in was the Golden Rooster and Hundred Flowers Film Festival two years ago. He took a picture of the red carpet and showed it to his mother in the distance. His mother showed the picture to relatives and friends. And Dong, in the eyes of relatives and friends, had made something of himself. Dong has been in the company for three years and three months, still writing plans in the planning department. And Yang, who came in later, is already a deputy manager in the market department. It is said that the head of HR is Yang's uncle. Dong used to not believe that relationships could dominate everything. But now he's starting to wobble. Every day starts with a crowded subway through the crowd and ends with a tired subway. The dishes for lunch are almost the same, and the songs sung by colleagues after work are the same, as if only those must sing songs can maintain the rhythm of the moment. Dong's circle of friends only allows browsing for the past three days, but he hasn't posted any updates for more than half a year. Dong has recently been thinking about what he used to be like. When people reach a certain situation, they will always begin to reminisce about the past, piece together the scattered memories that have been left behind and then look at the traces of the past and sigh in silence. In high school, Dong listened to Liu Ruying's I'm Here Too with his MP3 while reading the author Sen Mao's diary of the Sahara during self-study. The most indulgent pleasure was being able to ride a bike to the county stadium to play a game on Sunday afternoon. After working, he gritted his teeth and spent half a month's salary to watch Liu Ruying's concert, and then came back and told himself to earn money so he could fly to the Sahara in the future. The plan he is currently working on is a show about a certain brand of underwear. Dong has revised the draft three times, but the leader is not satisfied. The leader is a middle-aged woman who seems to be watertight in her words and deeds. On the fourth night of staying up late, Dong felt unbearable stomach pain and went to the pharmacy to buy some stomach medicine. A week later, the pain worsened, and Dong felt something was wrong. He was afraid it was gastroenteritis and he was also afraid it was appendicitis. He was always apprehensive about the existence of his appendix, fearing that one day it would become inflamed. It wasn't until he had to undergo a biopsy that Dong realized that he might have been chosen by God this time. Dong is a fan of Murphy's Law. He has always believed that this world is dominated by small probabilities, like when he was always ranked outside the top 10 for three years, but then scored third in his class on the college entrance exam or when it was always clear when he brought an umbrella, and the rain always poured down when he forgot to bring his umbrella, presenting all his unprepared embarrassment. This time, he prays to be a part of the small probability, on the side of the vast majority. Doctor, could it be malignant? Dong asked the doctor. The doctor looked to be about Dong's age. The nature of the condition remains to be inspected. It's rarely seen in usual circumstances. However, we still have to wait for the laboratory results, said the doctor. His words carefully measured and precise. In this modern world, more and more people have a tendency to speak cautiously, in very measured terms. Treating people with caution is becoming the norm, like the white-collar workers rushing in and out of the office buildings daily. They are either proficient or acting proficiently, as if that is the only way to gain trust. The next afternoon, the lab results came in, although there were no cancers in his family history. Dong was diagnosed with stage 3 stomach cancer. Doctor, is this, can this disease be cured? Dong felt like he had asked the most naive question in his life. As medical technology advances, the quality of life of cancer patients has improved correspondingly. And life expectancy. Doctor, how much time do I have left at most? The doctor looked at Dong, whose eyes were full of determination. He had never seen a cancer patient maintain such apparent composure. Typically, a year and a half. 
If surgery or chemotherapy work well, three to five years is also possible. Doctors most dislike to deliver precise predictions about life. But this time he laid out the whole truth for Dong, moved by Dong's gaze. Three days after making the appointment, Dong started chemotherapy. The day before entering the hospital, Dong handed in his resignation letter. Dong had envisioned his resignation many times, dramatically throwing his letter on his supervisor's desk, being pleaded by HR to stay, and his departure causing chaos in the department. Yet, all these were merely overthinking. Dong calmly gave his resignation to his boss, and they exchanged polite small talk. There was no begging him to stay, nor departmental chaos. They seemingly took it in stride, but everyone knew it was an individual preservation. Standing in the hospital lobby, Dong truly began to confront death. Only when one confronts death, can one truly come to understand oneself. The bustling, noisy hospital lobby was a sea of people and amongst them. There was both birth and death. Dong hadn't told anyone about his diagnosis or his upcoming chemotherapy treatment, including his mother, who lives far away in his hometown. Dong was the only child in his family. He was raised by his mother. He remembered that the most profound words his mother had ever said were once you are okay. People tend to remember their glorious moments, and those unbearable pasts also tend to be recalled at unbearable moments. Dong was lying on the hospital bed. Who knows what I'm going through? Dong spoke to himself. What will happen to my mom if I die? She only has me as her son. Dong again mused to himself. That young man in the next bed. He is quite handsome. Has no one in his family accompanying him for chemotherapy? Dong overheard other patients whispering in his ward. I am my mom's everything. I must be strong. Dong thought to himself. Dong still remembered how after school in elementary, he often saw his father abusing his mother. His father, malevolent in expression, his eyes vicious, his mother, her hair disheveled, blood at the corner of her mouth. Dong would hide in his room doing homework, while the sound of objects hitting the floor echoed from his parents' room. If you make any more noise, I swear, I will kill you. You damnable woman, go on and try. Even if you kill me, you will end up being shot to face life and death. Dong might have been connected since childhood, which allowed him to have extraordinary strength when faced with these realities. Life, after all, is not easy. During the past two months, Dong had undergone chemotherapy three times. Before the results came back, he had already returned to his hometown. The town looked the same as always. Hardly any changes. From the white fog emanating early in the morning from the breakfast shop, to the evening ending in dissipating cooking smoke, the town hadn't changed in decades. Dong's mother ran a breakfast shop in town. The two-story building had the shop on the first floor, where the mother and son lived on the second floor. The town's police station was diagonally opposite the shop, an old-fashioned building whose blue walls were beginning to show their age. Ivy grew and wilted on the wall. No one really knew how long this cycle had been repeating. The person Dong wanted to see was Officer Zhu from the police station. After his father left, Dong's mother started running the breakfast shop to make ends meet. Officer Zhu was a regular at the shop. Back when Dong was in junior high, he boarded at a school in the county, and Officer Zhu often came to pick him up on weekends. Everyone at school thought Officer Zhu was Dong's father. Officer Zhu's wife passed away when she was young and he was left alone with a son the same age as Dong. Officer Zhu's son was named Zhu, and Dong had known him since they were children. Dong's mother wanted him to call Officer Zhu Uncle Zhu, but Dong refused to change his way of addressing him. He mimicked others and kept calling him Officer Zhu. Officer Zhu wasn't at the station. He was out on duty. Dong sat in his office waiting for him. Over the past decade, this was the second time Dong had been to Officer Zhu's office. The last time was eight years ago when his mother suffered a kidney stone attack in the middle of the night and curled up on the bed, soaked with cold sweat. They could have waited till morning, but Dong couldn't bear to watch his mother in such pain any longer. He rushed to the police station and found Officer Zhu, who was on night duty. Officer Zhu, my mom has a stomachache and she can't take it anymore. 
the local health center had no on-duty doctor at night. Officer Zhu drove Dong's mother to the county hospital, sitting in Officer Zhu's office. Dong wondered why he disliked Officer Zhu. He has always known that Officer Zhu was different from other regular customers. His mother always laughed shyly in front of him, a smile she never had in front of Dong's father. Dong's mother said Officer Zhu was a good friend she could talk to, but Dong still referred to him as Officer Zhu. Mother and son tested each other, yet nothing was ever explicitly stated. Every weekend, Officer Zhu would let Dong sit in the middle of the motorcycle, with his son Zhu sitting in the back. Whenever they went to KFC in the county, he always let Dong order first, the week before the college entrance examination. In order to help students relax, Officer Zhu would drive to the county high school every night to pick Dong up and bring him home, and then drive him to school in the morning. On the half-hour drive, they seldom spoke a few words. Although they seemed like father and son to outsiders, the two of them knew better. They were miles apart. Actually, he was a good person. Dong thought to himself, the beginning of the dislike probably came on a casual day in a peaceful life. The small town is limited in size. People live their life in a leisurely pace. However, due to its size, People tend to gossip about each other. The woman who sells breakfast at the east end of town seems to have something going on with that police officer. That woman is pretty, but she has bad luck. Her man used to beat her when he was young, and now he's gone. That policeman looks good, and so does the woman. One man's gone, one woman's dead. They could make a pair. Dong did not like these whispers behind his back. These conversation topics that treated his mother like a joke to entertain others in their leisure time. He put all of these discontent on Officer Zhu. Dong didn't know how long he had been sitting in the office. The past 10 to 20 years seemed to rewind. The events were still the same. Yet the bitterness of when everything was shedding its innocence was no longer there. The office door was pushed open. And Officer Zhu walked in. Officer Zhu. Oh no. Inspector Zhu. My mom said you've been promoted to deputy inspector. Officer Zhu first wore a surprised look, and then laughed while patting Dong's shoulder. The two men sat opposite each other, just like the silent moments tens of years ago. Dong, why have you become thinner? Officer Zhu lit a cigarette. The food in the office is bad. They only serve ramen. For the first time in his life, Dong joked with the man sitting across from him. You should smoke less. It's bad for your health, Dong subconsciously added. Dong glanced at Officer Zhu. The one stall and upright man who used to wait for him outside the school gate now has streaks of white hair at his temples. I bought a pair of shoes for you. My mom said you wear size 42. Try them on. Dong handed a pair of leather shoes to Officer Zhu's feet and bent down to loosen the laces. You? Dong interrupted Officer Zhu, saying, I didn't like you before. I was afraid that you saw that my home was missing a father figure and intended to take advantage of my mom. I was afraid my mom would be fooled again. My mom had suffered a lot when she was young. She often got beaten up during the night and had to pretend that everything was fine in front of others during the day. Ever since my dad passed away, she got up early and worked late to sell breakfast and raise me. I thought that once I got into college and became successful, I could make her. Officer Zhu. Please be kinder to my mom in the future. The shoes fit well. Very nice. The office gives out shoes every year. So you don't need to bother in the future. It's not easy for you being far away from home. And your mom always misses you. Officer Zhu reached out and patted Dong's shoulder again. This was the only physical contact between Officer Zhu and Dong in tens of years. Uncle Zhu, come home for dinner after work. Dong was probably a born actor. He could hide all the scabs of growth, then get along with the world in a way that was gentle and peaceful as if they were not there at all. Just like now, when he perfectly concealed his illness without a single flaw. His high school classmates knew that Dong and his mother depended on each other. But nobody knew about Dong's unfortunate childhood and his long story. At 18, there were no smartphones, and a game called Farmville where players stole each other's crops was popular. The campus radio often played City and the Old Man and the Sea. Dong encountered the first crisis of his life at 18. In grade 2 of high school, 
he chose physical science, and his original class was disrupted. He was integrated into another class. He knew no one, and everyone seemed like strangers. But Dong was not lost, for adaptation was his biggest strength. The crisis came from his deskmate, Yu. He was known as the bad student in class, who used his features resembling Hong Kong actor Raymond Lam to attract girls from other classes. Yu had innate social skills. He even went to other schools to gather a large group of diehards. He once got into a fight behind the lecture hall and was publicly criticized by the whole school. Most difficult for Dong was. You liked to talk to Dong when Dong was answering questions during self-study. I heard you're a good student. Huh? Your former class PE representative told me. Hey. You know. He's nothing. You see. He's tall and strong. But he's really timid. Shh. You're so quiet. That's gonna put you at a disadvantage when you go out into society. I don't have many strengths. But I'm good at messing around. I can show you. Shh. If you shush me again, I'm gonna need to pee. Believe it or not, I could do it right now. You had a point. I spoke little and hence often found myself at a disadvantage. After starting work, my boss would praise me for my quiet diligence. But when it came to promotions, I was always overlooked. Little Dong, I heard that your father ran away. My dad's like that too always not coming home because of social gatherings. You said spinning his pen around. Who told you? Dong stopped writing and stared at you. Hey, I was just asking. Why are you glaring at me? That was the first time Dong fought with a classmate. Books scattered all over the table, without any prior experience in fighting. Dong was doing everything he could to hold on to you as they tussled on the ground. I just mentioned your father ran away. Let go or I won't be so nice. You, both taller and stronger, pinned Dong to the ground with his legs. With one hand he held Dong by the collar, and with the other, he clenched his fist warningly before Dong's face. You didn't hit him. He and Dong each wrote a 5,000 words self-reflection. From then on, the whole class knew that Dong relied on his mother for a living. Dong made up with you one evening after night self-study, in the chilly night of the late fall, with a foggy sheen in the air. Everything seemed desolate. Dong was walking past a bookstore near the school after a bath. He noticed you in a dispute with two young men. It seemed like the two loafers were trying to extort money from you. There was hardly anyone around the school gate. Only the dim street lights could be seen. When Dong saw one of the ruffians picking up a piece of green tile from the ground, he stepped forward. The tile was meant to hit you, but Dong firmly gripped it. In the face of a fight, it was indeed a wild horse. The two skinny loafers were already having a rough time. Seeing Dong joining in, they quickly fled. The green tile cut Dong's hand, and blood seeped out. Is your hand okay? I can buy some medicine for you. No need. A wash would do. Dong, carrying his bag of clean clothes, walked towards his rental apartment. You called out from behind. I was wrong that day. I shouldn't have mentioned your family matters. I appreciate your help today. Consider me in debt to you. If you ever need help in the future, just let me know. Dong's mother did not have any insurance. So Dong planned to use three years of his savings to purchase commercial elderly insurance for her. If he could secure a stable old age for his mother, he would die in peace. His savings fell short by 20,000 yuans. After a week of thought, Dong rang you up. You who didn't make it to university, served in the military for two years before he began dealing second-hand cars with his family. The boom in the car sales market saw him prosper in the small county town. That's how life can be when in school. Everyone longs to go out into the world. The so-called world outside can only truly be felt if one is physically there. Often ironic, yet truly real, are those deemed bad students by teachers who flip their fortunes due to their audacity. You had put on some weight since high school, dressing in a suit and leather shoes. His hair immaculately groomed. I haven't seen you in years. You've changed quite a bit. Came to see your old desk mate in the provincial capital. How's that? Not too disappointing, right? Over a meal. They finished a bottle of Baiju and with a bit of a buzz. You haven't changed at all. 
You said, you know, I looked up to you in high school. I sat at the back of the class. You were the only good kid who sat at the same desk as me. Back then, I did look out for you. Too bad you couldn't see it. I always wanted to chat with you. But you never acknowledged people. You continued. I noticed. Despite your tough persona, you weren't too bad towards me. Dong said, Not too bad. You laughed heartily at this. Dong poured himself a glass of wine, gulped it down. Then after a moment of thought, he said, Do you remember the favor you said you owed me back in high school? I remember. The time you helped me beat up the bullies. Can I ask for it to be repaid now? You just say it. Whatever I can do. I will. I need to borrow 20,000 yuan, but I might not be able to repay it. You joking? I'm not kidding. I want to buy my mama retirement insurance. I'm short of money I have stage 3 stomach cancer. In Yu's mind. Dong never lied. When did this happen? Three months ago. It was diagnosed at the provincial hospital. Yu poured himself a full glass. One gulp down. The next day. You remitted 100,000 yuans to Dong. Dong returned 80,000 and sent a WeChat message to you. Old desk mate. Thank you. Three months after chemotherapy, Dong felt more and more changes in his body. The frequency of abdominal pain began to increase. He didn't go to the hospital again. He bought all the painkillers with all the money in his social security card. He heard that the late stage of cancer is very painful. Dong was a little scared. He began to face death, but inexplicably worried about the pain. In his three years of work, Dong seldom goes to the hospital. He would just sleep when he had a cold or fever. He had a sum of money in his social security card. He gritted his teeth and bought some imported painkillers for cancer. He tore up the medicine box and medicine instructions and put the tablets into a portable plastic pillbox. Would it be a bit of a waste if he didn't finish it and died? If he knew. He wouldn't buy imported medicine. It's heartbreakingly expensive. Dong learned to make fun of his own jackpot. Before he died, he had some things to do. Mom, do you know how to book train tickets online? I'm not going anywhere far. I don't need to take the train. Don't you want to go out and play when you get old? When I'm old, I count on you to take me out. Dong fell silent. Mom, didn't you say you went to the central hospital in the next city last time for dry eye syndrome? Yes. The big hospital is good. The disease gets better quickly. How did you get there? Do you know how to take the subway in the city? It's not that troublesome. We have a van going to the big hospital there. 40 yuan per person. Directly to the hospital entrance. Dong fell silent again. His mother seems to be far from this internet society. But people of her age have their own rules for survival. Mom, let me teach you how to book train tickets online. What if I'm not there when you get old in the future? Dong taught his mother how to book train tickets online. Online shopping. He taught her to use mobile payment. But he was afraid of his mother being cheated. He repeatedly told his mother that the bank card bound to the payment should hold a maximum of 2,000 yuan. If anything costs more than 2,000, go to the town to buy it. He was still worried. He kept telling their mother how scammers commit crimes on the internet. It seemed as if he was back to his childhood, when his mother repeatedly taught him to be focused when eating, greet elders when he sees them, be cautious when strangers approached. When he was little, the mother was afraid to let go of her child. Therefore, she taught the child survival skills in advance. But now, Dong seemed to be a parent, and his mother seemed like a child. Dong thought of his own father, the man who used to beat his wife when he was young. Later, he fought with people outside and was put in jail for injuring people with a knife. He once saw his father in the detention center, and the father came over before he went to college and gave some money. Over the past decade, the number of times he saw his own father could be counted on one hand. His father was a lorry driver who often traveled from north to south for long journeys. Dong still had memories of his father's love. When his father returned from his journey, he would bring Dong gifts from different regions, a children's watch from a city, a football from a county. Dong liked to play football, perhaps related to the football his father gave him when he was 10. 
Dong's mother was a beauty praised by others, and his father was successful in making money. In third grade, Dong was the envy of his classmates. One day in junior high school, two police officers came to the school to find Dong. Dong was brought to the detention center in the neighboring county. He could never forget the sight of his father there. His father's eyes had lost their shine and looked at Dong with a combination of fear and guilt. Dong dialed his father's number, one that hadn't changed in over a decade. Although Dong seldom made the call, he could still dial the string of numbers on the screen without hesitation. He and his father arranged to meet at a small tavern on the old street in the county town. It was Dong's first time drinking with his father, and possibly the last. The world measures with numbers, sometimes astronomical, sometimes just down to one. Dong's father had aged, no longer upright, his eyes wrinkled, not quite the same as in Dong's memory. Are you doing okay lately? Dong asked. Doing okay? I don't drive trucks anymore. I deliver goods to supermarkets in various towns in a small delivery van instead. Do you often have to drink when you work? The father asked. It's okay. Occasionally. Don't drink too much. It can easily lead to problems. This is the typical topic of Chinese fathers. They like to ask their grown-up sons whether they drink alcohol, how to get along with their leaders, and how to handle relationships with people around them. Do you live alone or are you married? Dong asked. For many years, Dong never cared about this issue, much as he never cared about his own father. I didn't get married, but I'm living with a single lady. She has a daughter, who is in ninth grade. Hope you're doing well. Dong, I owe you in this lifetime. I know you hate me. I am guilty. I didn't dare to see you whenever I passed our town. I have been to jail and you must have been mocked by classmates. If you are capable, forget me in the future. So, you don't get upset when you think of me. I heard you are working in the provincial capital. A great achievement. Among our family, you are the only one capable of getting out and finding a good job. Dong down the liquor in his glass, poured another for himself and filled his father's glass. Dong raised his glass and said, Dad, I propose a toast to you father and son for a lifetime. It's also fate. I did hate you before. I hate that you became the biggest black spot and annoyance in my life. I'm not going to hate you anymore. Really, just live your life. Tears streamed down the father's face in front of Dong, and Dong's tears swirled in his eyes. Life is a tangle of contradictions right and wrong. Love and hate. Justice and injustice. We are always reconciling with others and ourselves putting down long-held obsessions. How many months left until death? More than half of the painkillers were already consumed. Dong confessed his reality to his mother after the mid-autumn festival. Some people can deceive others for a while, but not forever. Some things can be hidden for a while, but not forever. Dong's body began to betray him. His cheeks sunk in. His skin turned dark yellow and sometimes he would rush to the bathroom to vomit violently before he even finished a bowl of rice. Mom, I have cancer. It's in the middle and late stages. In the afternoon, Dong and his mother were sitting in a breakfast shop, peeling soybeans while watching TV. Dong spoke absent-mindedly. After speaking, Dong looked at his mother pleadingly, hoping to receive her forgiveness. I knew you had something hiding from me. His mother glanced at Dong and then back at the TV. Tears began to flow. Dong talked about his illness from start to end, as if telling a stranger's story. Mom, I've always been afraid of seeing you unhappy. Can you send me away happily? I have always been clingy since I was a child, like a glue stick. Let's pretend nothing happened in these days. Just live like we used to. Dong wiped away his mother's tears. You've had a hard life. His mother couldn't stop her tears. Mom, I feel really happy. I never envied classmates who had designer clothes, and I have never envied others who had lots of pocket money. Remember when we were happy to have a braised chicken foot meal? We didn't eat the last one. You gave it to me, and I gave it to you. His mother smiled, tearfully. Dong felt the weight lifted from his heart after he confided in his mother. He looked weak. 
but he was more spirited. Su came on the third day after Dong had told his mother. Dong knew that his mother had told Officer Zhu, and Officer Zhu had told Zhu. Su arrived by car and parked outside the breakfast shop, rolling down the window. He shouted loudly for Dong inside the shop. After graduation, Zhu went to the police academy and joined the criminal investigation team in the city. Zhu and Dong knew each other from a young age, like but unlike friends, like but unlike brothers. But the world itself is a mystery. Zhu and Dong were in the same middle school, but not the same class, the same high school, but not the same class, the same university city, but not in the same class. Officer Zhu and Dong's mom had accompanied Zhu and Dong to the provincial city. On the train, Officer Zhu asked Zhu to take care of Dong, and Dong's mother asked Dong to call Zhu out for dinner on weekends. Dong came out of the shop. Why are you here? Get in the car. I'll take you for a ride. There was a slow English song playing in the car. Did you hear about my situation? Yeah, I heard from my dad. I'm fine. It's just like... Dong was going to say death, but he stopped. He didn't want to make the atmosphere awkward. I always knew you were strong. You too. I always thought you were carefree. And you're still the same now. As a child, Dong didn't like Officer Zhu, but Zhu didn't reject Dong's mom. On weekends, Officer Zhu often left Zhu at Dong's home. Zhu could eat two bowls of rice at a time and would say to Dong's mom, Auntie, your cooking tastes much better than my dad's. Sometimes, when Officer Zhu was busy, Zhu would stay and sleep at Dong's home, sharing a bed with Dong. Dong, your bed is much softer and comfier than mine. This pair of unlikely brothers, their friendship was not about where their parents were. They seemed to have a natural ability to understand each other, and their little plots couldn't escape each other's eyes. Dong, I know you never wanted my dad to be your dad. Su said this the first time they shared a bed, and I know you. You get close to me and my mom is just an act for your dad to see. Children with broken hearts can't be carefree. They've seen through each other long ago. The English song in the car played slowly, like narrating the old times. Su parked the car by the side of a deserted road. He took out two plane tickets from his jacket pocket and handed one to Dong. It's a plane ticket to Egypt in July. In college, wasn't it during one of our dinners that you said you wanted to experience Sahara firsthand? That was when Dong had invited Zhu for a meal during college. Following his mother's instructions, Dong remembered what Zhu looked like at that time fresh out of the police academy. Intensely physical training had given him a shiny dark complexion, like a black-faced warrior. When I asked you where you wanted to go after graduation, you said Sahara. I really thought you were crazy at that time. I don't like reading and don't know about San Mao. But you said Sahara is vast enough to make one feel as small as dust. Desolate enough to make one forget life and death. You said there's absolute freedom there. After listening to you, I also wanted to go. When I was little, I hated my dad. He was too busy to take care of me and often left me with different people. I can understand your feelings and your desire for freedom. Children from broken homes crave freedom. Even a wild run without a destination is a luxury. Thank you. Dong looked at Su in front of him. We. I'll be the brother. And you'll be the younger brother. Otherwise. I don't agree with my dad marrying your mom. Dong and Zhu were the same age. But Dong was two months older. Okay. But you need to come home for meals regularly. Just like when we were little. Praising my mom's cooking. Also, you can take my room, come back and stay more often. Seeing the one stuff Zhu shedding tears, he reached out and hugged Dong. Zhu, my mom said you're getting married at the end of the year. If I'm still alive by then, I'll be your best man, if wishes could come true. I would hope that children born in the 90s and who are the only child, could avoid Dong's story and be treated kindly by time.